So um, we want to talk about mobile format today. I often get asked uh, where we should focus for continued growth in today's climate and also the importance of innovation and how to stimulate it. And people ask me, you know, um, how to go about that in their businesses. And the way I do it is, is what I call format thinking. So how to think from a format perspective. And this is how we kind of win awards on mobile. Um, first of all, um, mobile is becoming quite cool now. And we were recently called the Mad Men of Mobile. And it made me think about the days of the Mad Men in 1941. And I found this. This is the first mobile phone. <laughs> this is the American Army. Um, and this was the first mobile in the UK. This is Reginald Blevin, uh, our postmaster general, trying out his car phone. Uh, this was the first real mobile. This could dial into telephone networks. Before that, they were just like radio phones, right, or, or CB radios. It's 1972. But this was the, the actual first consumer model. I don't know if any of you remember this. This is 83. This is uh, Martin Cooper with the famous brick. And this is Frank Picard not from uh, Starship Enterprise, and, and uh, he's making the first mobile phone call on television. This was 88, and you can see Salomon have already branded it. This was the first smartphone, 1997. Uh, it's the Philips Synergy, and guess what? It could read faxes. Couldn't read emails. I don't, I'm not even sure there was much of those about. This was the first time I got interested in mobile. This is 99. This is uh, obviously Barbie, and I think when, when Barbie gets her first mobile, you can pretty much be sure everyone's got one. This is the famous Motorola StarTac, which was based on, on Star Trek. Um, and this was the first time people started to use mobiles for other things than making calls, kind of. This is 2005, this is the Live 8 concert in, in England, and people are holding up their mobile instead of their lighter. And what I want to do is bring back a really old exercise that I've been, well, I used to do this in speeches 10 years ago, but I do, can you all just get your phone out and hold it up for me? Because I'm not sure any of you will have seen this before. This has been done a lot in many conferences. Just hold it up. What well, I should, yeah, ah, you see. Now what I want you to do is pass it to the person on your right, please. Just pass it to the person next to you. Now, I've got a simple question. How does that feel? Does it feel a bit weird? Yeah. I've got your phone here. I mean, does it feel like you've lost, a, you know, you've lost a leg, you've lost a limb, right? You feel a bit strange. It feels like you've lost a limb. I'm going to pass it back. So what I want you to do is remember that feeling because um, mobile is so personal to us and when you're working on this platform, if you start with that feeling, you'll start in a really good place from a creative perspective, yeah? Because it's really, really personal and we're gonna talk a bit more about that in a minute. So this is 2006, people starting to use phones for other things than making calls. Here's, we've got a guy taking a photo on holiday. And again, 2006, this is a really interesting shot. This is students at the Ramallah University who are taking a, a, a picture of Stephen Hawking arriving for a lecture, and they're all using phones. We all know what phones did to the camera industry, and soon it's gonna happen with credit cards too. Only in America, 2007, this is the World Texting Championships. And then 2008, launch of the iPhone, right? Which is like six years ago. Um, and um, 2013, we've got the Google Nexus One. So, you know, we're starting to get incredibly um, uh, powerful with the devices. So that's a little warm up. Uh, I used to always show stats to clients about mobile, how many smartphones there were, you know, why they should use it, graphs and stuff. I don't bother anymore. I just show them this. This is a little film showing the influence of mobile on shoppers. Earlier this week we showed you a video of a woman who mistakenly fell into the fountain at a Pennsylvania mall because she was distracted by text messaging. Well, now that woman is suing the mall for not helping her. The video has received more than one and a half million views since it went viral on YouTube last week. The well, woman in the video, it. Kathy Cruz Marrero, doesn't think the video is very funny. She claims Long she again, could have seriously hurt and the security guards should have helped instead of laughed at her. I'm just like dumbfounded 
and all I kept saying was, I fell, I fell, I fell in the fountain, I fell in the fountain. Marrero has hired a lawyer to pursue legal action. The investigation is ongoing at the mall as to who leaked the video online. You can hear more from Marrero and her attorney tomorrow on Good Morning America. So things are changing. No need for stats anymore. Everyone knows we've got a phone. Now this is some stuff that I wrote on the way here, so I'm going to read it. To understand the mobile format and human behavior, I thought it would be fun to go on a three-part journey from 50,000 years ago to today and to the year 2020 and beyond. And we're gonna go through this journey of change and the format of mobile and the future of what I call connected media, creativity. So the speed of change. In 1960, which was 12 years before I was born, and I'm 42, C.P. Snow, the physicist wrote, up until this century, change was so slow it would pass unnoticed in one person's lifetime. That's no longer the case. Today, the rate of change has increased so much that not even our imagination can keep up with it. In 1970, which was two years before I was born, Warren Bennis, who's a pioneer in leadership studies, he said the throttle has been pushed so far forward in recent years that no exaggeration, no hyperbole, no outrage can realistically describe the extent and pace of change in the world today. In fact, only the exaggerations seem to be true. And his words are even more relevant today than they were 40 three years ago, 44 years ago. The pace of change in our industry is remarkable. So has anyone read Alvin Toffler, Future Shock? Because that's a, a, a good reference that I'm reading at the moment. And in that book, Alvin Toffler, Future Shock, he says, the world of today, is as, the world of today, 2014, is as different from the world was when I was born, 72, as that world was from the day of Julius Caesar which was 44 BC, right? So what he's saying is, according to Toffler, in terms of change, more change has happened in the last 40 years than the whole of human history, pretty much. He's basically saying, I was born in the middle of human history, which is weird. Um, and I, I wasn't sure. So I thought we'd have a look at that. Humans have been around for 50,000 years, right? Which equates to 800 lifetimes of about 62 years in each lifetime. So I had a look at it, and, and the first 650 of those lifetimes were spent in caves. Not much change there, 650 lifetimes. Only in the last 75 lifetimes has it been possible to communicate from one lifetime to another. Guess what this is? This is the first tablet. And it's the oldest example of writing. It's from Uruk in, in Africa. It's 4,000 years old. So only in the last 75 lifetimes have people been able to pass information across generations. It's only during the last six lifetimes that the masses had the printed word. Just six. And only the last three have we seen things like the electric motor. This is one of the first electric motors in a washing machine. Um, and it's this 800th lifetime which seems to mark a sharp break with all past human experience. Pretty much all the material goods we use today have been developed in one lifetime. Um, the practice of the creative has expanded beyond the world of advertising and marketing. So, you know, Steve Jobs, this kind of thing. Um, in many of the companies of today, we find creative technologists, for example. Um, and as creative, we're in the business of human understanding. So we use human understanding to create business advantage for our clients. And David Ogilvy once said about the advertising industry that change is our lifeblood and stagnation is our death knell. These devices, they, com they contain more computing power than the entire Apollo moon mission, including all of the computers on the ground and in space put together, each device. So if you think the capsule that landed on the moon ran on half a K processing power, and these devices have got 32 gig, well, it's memory, it's not processing, but still. There's 1,000 K in a meg, 1,000 meg in a gig. So if I, if I had told, if I went back those three lifetimes when that washing machine was being invented, and I told them that in just three lifetimes from today, we'd be walking around with computers in our pockets, more powerful than the entire Apollo moon mission, they'd think I was insane, 
And they'd also, mainly because they wouldn't believe that we could fly to the moon. So how does this all mean for creative? Well, I'm talking about format. And, and this is what I really want to get across today. And if there's one thing, walk away with the format thinking you'll, you'll really get on well, I think. Um, so the format of watercolour is different to oil, right? Simple. You paint differently because the format's different. Does anyone know what the first TV ad was? No? Well, in England it was Colgate, and globally it was for Boulevard watches. It was in the middle of the baseball. It was in 1941. I've got the ad here, but I couldn't find the copy, so I'm going to have to do that myself. And um, it's to prove this point about the format, but also to show that any new medium borrows from mediums that come before, and it's a real mistake from a creative perspective. Stealing is great, by the way. That's absolutely, Picasso said, art is theft. And if anyone shows you a picture in an art gallery and says, oh, that's unique, then they just don't know the references. But I think borrowing is, you know, di directly borrowing stuff and putting it onto a new medium doesn't work. So um, let me play this ad and, and, and I'll see if we can show, show the point. Um, okay, here we go. America runs on bull over time. can't wait another 12 seconds. So that's it, first TV ad. It's like a 30 second ad with a couple of seconds copy in the middle, blatantly stolen, or borrowed I should say, from radio and press. You know, singularly fails to fulfill the potential of the medium, right? Well, the thing is, is the format of TV is defined by the unique elements. There's a screen and a speaker, right? The thing is, that there's a screen that exists in a newspaper, it goes, it's a frame around a picture, there's a, there's a speaker in a radio. The unique thing is they're put together in one device, and it seems really simple, but obviously when we look at that, it's not. It's not straightforward because it was new and it took a while. It took about 10 years for great TV creative to come through. And I think the same thing for mobile. Um, you know, the unique format of mobile is defined by the elements. So you've got a microphone which goes in, Touch screen goes in, speaker comes out, camera goes in, you know, GPS. And there's, I mean, this phone's got about 50 sensors. So from a format perspective, when we're thinking about briefs or thinking about working on mobile, if we can work out which elements are the best ones to tell our story, you know, the watercolour versus oil, and work with those elements in our thinking, then it's mobile work. You know, but if we make something on a phone which can exist on a laptop, then if you're going to be purist about it, it's not mobile work. There's some exceptions to that. If, you have a, if you're on a train and you need to look at some information in a mobile site, you know, but generally, from a, from a really creative perspective, this is the kind of format thinking. So this was my first attempt, um, 2007, um, seven years ago, and it was for Fanta. The brief was more play. The insights were adults are the enemies of play, children like to talk in code languages, so you've got like Morse code, they love that. And this is what we came up with. We realised the speaker was the best thing to use. Fanta believed teens should have the right to play. This idea was inspired by the controversial ultrasonic alarms used to disperse teenage groups. These play high-pitched sounds which only young people can hear. When you get older, you can't hear these sounds anymore, as your hearing naturally gets worse. Morning first, our main story for you this morning. The sonic device known as the mosquito, used to stop teenagers gathering near public places, should be banned. That's according to England's Children's Commissioner. The mosquito, as it's called, emits a high-pitched noise which manufacturers claim can only be heard by those under 25. Critics say it's an ineffective way of tackling antisocial behaviour and that it demonises young people. We turned this technology on its head. The mobile application we invented, the Fanta Stealth Sound System, enables the same teenagers to communicate between themselves using these high-pitched frequencies which adults cannot hear. The application has already generated considerable media interest. Directions to the website is on over 50 million packs in Great Britain. The viral film has been seeded to over 4 million teenagers across Europe. We felt this is the perfect way of engaging with our core target group of, of teenagers 
in a, a way that we haven't done before. So I mean, it's a one thing to to put out a TV ad that is that is nice, and it's another thing to actually put out something that consumers are excited about and that they use every day uh, amongst their their peers. So it helped us to become part of uh, a community, and the community is, is our teenagers. So it's it's brilliant. It's a perfect tool to you know that represents what Fanta stands for to overcome you know adulthood and boredom. Uh, that is part of that, and give give our core target group a, a way to communicate with each other uh, without the rest of the world knowing. So I mean, how cool is that? I personally like just the 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 facial expressions of people who can hear it versus those who cannot hear it. And if you put both together in one room, it's amazing the reactions that you see. As a demonstration, and just in case you don't understand the idea fully, we have been playing the stealth sounds all the way through this film. So those of you around the age of 16 will have heard the sounds loud and clear. And those over a certain age would have heard absolutely nothing at all. So who's the youngest here? Anyone, anyone hear the sounds? Oh, really? Yeah. Are you kidding me? I couldn't hear anything. How old are you? 21. Golly. So that's really old. And um, as you can see, um, it's really nice when you start to use the unique elements, you know, in the format thinking to tell stories, deal with briefs. I had 1.3 million downloads uh, two and a half years before, you know, the iPhone launched. So it was insanely popular. Um, this is a very, bringing it all the way, this is from last year. This is a banner ad, which again, it uses a different, uh, th this uses the touch screen. Um, and it also really encompasses the entire, you know, thinking about, about format. It's really clever. It's an ad for a test drive, um, and it's really quick, so, so have a good look at this. Bonjour. Remarkable piece of advertising, really, really nice. This is a piece of work which looks at the SIM card and um, what you can do with that. For Philippine public schools, textbooks have become a burden. But while developed countries have solved this problem through tablets and e-readers, for these families, even the cheapest models cost more than their whole monthly income. In fact, the only gadgets most of them own are old analog mobile phones. Then we realized, what if we could use these millions of old phones to create a new brand of textbook? Smart, the country's largest telecom, took its mission to make text light and easy further than ever, as we introduced Smart Textbooks. Over six months, we collaborated with respected textbook publishers to condense official texts into text messages. These were then programmed into the inboxes of thousands of inactive surplus SIM cards, which were then repackaged into new smart textbooks. We launched them in partner schools, where the simple and in fact low-tech solution made a profound sustainable impact. It turned even the oldest phone and old SIM cards into a new brand of textbook. So less effort was spent carrying and storing books, and far more effort learning from them. And with petitions and pledges from education sector members, Smart Textbooks is going even further. With plans already underway for more subjects, kits so schools themselves can reproduce Smart Textbooks for free, and best of all, a rollout across the entire Philippines. Well, we always like to be at the cutting edge of an innovation, particularly relevant innovation. Malakaro, we bigyan natin sila lahat ng tablets, pero sa ngayon, dapat si muna natin. Ito pinaka perfect na simula. Fulfilling Smart's mission to make every kind of text light and easy for all. Just insanely good. That one Grand Prix. Um, you know, there's a lot of memory space in, in, in SIM cards. We had an idea yesterday actually about giving um, with a certain product a SIM card that had a phone book already filled in with numbers like Richard Branson's phone number and stuff like that. You know, so. 
Um, it's just really interesting what you can do. Then, of course, the cloud came along. So we're kind of going back in time. Going back. But, you know, these elements all changed with, with cloud. So I think this becomes your ears. You know, the screen becomes your skin. The camera becomes your eyes. Uh, literally, because of the processing power you can, you can do. And I mean, with, with the camera one, I mean, I've got so many examples, but this one is, um, this, this, this is a remarkable piece of work. Um, and think about also how they've used crowdsourcing here and also how um, they've taken away the personal element. You'll see what I mean at the end. I'll, I'll explain it at the end, but this is called Third Eye. It's amazing. Third eye. Viewfinder image. Double tap to take a picture. Uploading. Awaiting reply. I see a small stream in the foreground. Shape the next reply. To your left, I see red tulips blooming. There's a group of runners stretching and warming up. Uploading. The oranges are from Australia, and they look very fresh. I see a great buy, you should get them. Um, this one's out of Ogilvy, Paris. It's called Scrabble Wi-Fi. And again, um, I mean, this isn't particularly mobile, but it's a really interesting way of getting people to trial the product. Uh, using mobile and Wi-Fi. So this is kind of pushing it a little bit on the format. Incredible things, smartphones. They connect countries, buy things, organize lives, entertain us with hundreds of games. But the more we use them, the more we're forgetting how to spell. That's why we created Scrabble Wi-Fi, a playful way to turn words into passwords. Scrabble placed free Wi-Fi hotspots in places where you can't get an internet connection. But to get online, you had to prove your spelling skills. Select the Scrabble network. Create any word using up to seven letters. Play it. The score from the word is converted into free Wi-Fi minutes. And the higher your score, the longer the connection. Words that you shared on Facebook doubled your score and time. In just two weeks, people played more than 6,000 words. That could fill 306 Scrabble boards. We gave away over 110,000 minutes of free Wi-Fi, showing that words can unlock a world of fun. Scrabble, bringing letters and people together. Have you guys seen a lot of stuff in dual screening? You know about dual screening? Massive trend. You know, most people are watching TV with their mobile or tablet next to them at home. You see Google search spikes based on the ads that are on telly. Loads of TV shows are, are using that. Well, I, I did one for the gadget show, and the brief was um, the gadget show world tour. And we thought it'd be great if we could do 360 film. So what you see here is the TV. This is what they see on television at home. 
And if you've got the Gadget Show app, you get the 360 experience. So we re-scripted, this is a TV ad, 90 second TV ad. We re-scripted the ad so that they walked off screen. We dressed the set for 360. So the script takes them off screen and, and people think, well, I can't see them, what's going on? And then they start searching online and there's this massive buzz going on. Assembled here, in fact, all of that in there. Send it off. Watch this, he throws the money now across the studio. I'm not sure where he came from, but it does remind me that we're starting the whole shebang off in Japan. Oh yes, but Jace, the plane. Ah. Of Start the engines! Yeah, and cue the voice of a guy. I've got these kind of six insights about the future which are quite interesting from this format perspective. The first one is hardware is going to be hyper-connected, right? So by hardware, I mean surface computers, fridges, cars, phones, you know, these kind of things. Here we've got a load of people in a bar. There's a couple of restaurants and bars that have got surface computers in London. But this guy's put his phone down on the bar. This is kind of the year 2020, basically. And the table saying, would you like to buy some drinks for these guys? His phone saying, would you like to pay? We've got a little ad here saying, would you like to book a cab? So this is a hyper-connected hardware scenario. The second one is um, hyper-connected software. So by software, I mean profiles, Facebook, YouTube, Amazon. I mean, if you mix your eBay profile with your Facebook profile, what does that mean? So here we've got a guy, the hardware is hyper-connected. He's watching a James Bond film. But his software is hyper-connected as well, which means he's not in the market for an Aston Martin, but there's a jacket that's just come up, which is perfect, fits with the profile of something he bought the other day, so he's getting pinged off to buy the jacket. It then follows that um, the world of mobile will become contextual, right? And the work we do will have to be contextual. So here we've got a guy, he's in Ireland and he's reading a book, but he's in a hyper-connected hardware and software world, so he's getting a couple of pings. He's getting a ping here from a, a shop he's near to, and he's getting a ping from a, 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 an outdoor advert. But he's getting sightseeing here, but he's getting apartments to rent. And the context is, you know, due to his LinkedIn profile, we know that he's actually there for work. Uh, he's not there for holiday. So he's getting contextual stuff, basically. Not the best idea, but... And, it, and I think it then follows, the next insight is that mobile will become a, like um, a digital wand, for want of a better word. So um, this thing is like, you've got a Ford ad of the future and there's three people walking past it and they're all getting different stuff based on their profiles. So this guy's getting the latest kind of concept car. This guy's um, getting car hire because he's on holiday. But this guy, his car is pinging him through the ad because he's got Ford and the car's hyper-connected, and it's telling him the state of his gearbox, you know, how much oil's in the car and all this kind of thing. I think these digital wands will direct media. So this lady has been to the dome, and on the way out, she's been pinged a, a free MP3, and she's chosen to play it in her car. It's an ad. But she could quite easily fling it onto her TV at home or onto her fridge or a mirror in a bathroom, you know, this kind of thing. So mobile directed media. And I think the final kind of insight is that from our perspective as creatives, we're, advertising is going to change massively, I, I think. Um, and I think it already has. So advertising for me used to be like the powerful preaching to the grateful. So it's not the powerful preaching to the grateful so much anymore because, you know, brands aren't the powerful ones anymore. It's the viewers now, because of Twitter and social, they can kill you in a minute. So where we are today is a place of insight-driven brand experience. So we make, you know, insight-driven experiences of brands. That's what the Fanta thing was. You're experiencing more play, you know, and um, that's where we are today. I think in the year 2020, we're going to be in this place where we have to make um, ideas of value as ads which sounds quite hard, you know, giving them ideas that are valuable to them as an ad. But if the world's hardware is hyper-connected and software is hyper-connected, everything's contextual and, 
you have a digital wand and you can direct mobile media, then it's going to be a lot easier than it seems. And this is a really bad example, but this is a lady with an internet fridge and these already exist. Um, it knows what's in it, right? Um, and um, she's then on the way to the supermarket and she gets an ad from someone like Hellman's and it says, in your fridge you've got some pasta and chicken which has got one day before it goes off. So by the way, here's a great recipe to use Hellman's to make the most of what's in your fridge today, buy some Hellman's, you know. So last couple of slides, I, I want to really go really far forward now and, and give another reference. Has anyone read Neuromancer by William Gibson? Fairly old book, but it's about tech and it talks about how technology is getting smaller and closer to us. And this is one of the lead characters in Neuromancer. She's got chips in her head. You should read it, it's, it's quite cool. And it's starting to happen. You know, we're talking 100 years away now, maybe, but when you've got the Moore's Law stuff going on, where computers are doubling in processing power and getting smaller every year, um, you know, this starts to get quite interesting. <coughs> so, technology is getting smaller and closer to us, and I think mobile is becoming like a physiological part of us. So, remember earlier when we passed the phone, how you felt? Well, it's like it's much bigger than that because. Ten years ago, 70% of people could remember five telephone numbers off the top of their head. I don't know if any of you can remember five telephone numbers now, can you? Well, today it's less than 30% because of the contacts app in your phone. People think, people think, talk, listen differently. So when people give you directions today, a lot of people just turn off. They go, oh yeah, right there. But actually they're thinking, I've got Google Maps on my phone. I don't need to listen to you. Um, and guess what happens, they go out and they can't get a connection and they're lost. So I think the physiological effects of technology is something which is really happening and there's not, not many people talking or thinking about that. So that was my kind of last piece. I think, um, you know, if we can, instead of asking what it is, work out what we can do with it, it will be pretty cool.